the Navy's senior officers failed to appreciate either the capabilities or the limitations of their unique fleet asset, the flying carriers. The scout airships were open ocean search vessels, no more at home in the Rocky Mountains than any other type of ship of the fleet. Macon was ordered to participate in Atlantic fleet maneuvers. Sending her airplanes on ahead, she left Moffett Field on the 20th of April, 1934. Where the battle fleet used the Panama Canal to change operating theaters, the ZRS ships were not permitted to fly south to avoid dangerous mountains in their path. The shallow maneuvering room of a pass through the mountains was very risky since bobbing over pressure height caused loss of lifting gas through the relief valve. Chief Rigger Robert Davis had been suspicious of the stern's overall strength and had familiarized his crew with the location of the preformed shoring planks. These damage control materials matched the hull pattern in the ship's girders. When Macon transited the tight mountain pass near Van Horn, Texas, Davis was keeping a watchful eye back aft. When violent winds suddenly broke the starboard horizontal fins attachment structure, Davis quickly organized a repair gang and trussed the broken girders. Davis was credited with saving his ship that day. Macon finally arrived at Opelaka, Florida and moored at the operations base on the 22nd of April. Goodyear Zeppelin engineers had by that time created a plan to reinforce the Macon's tail and already had many parts manufactured. They arrived on the next train and worked 16-hour days to strengthen the fin mountings damaged in the crossing. More complete repairs were not possible at Opelaka's mooring circle, but no one wanted to return to Lakehurst. Horrendous weather challenged Macon's crew. Sudden rain would necessitate pumping ballast overboard. Then bright sun would superheat the cells so ballast would have to be pumped back in. The tent facilities did not mask the discomfort of vicious mosquitoes and potentially damaging owls that lodged between the outer cover and the gas cells. Finally, the repairs were judged complete and Macon lifted off to join the fleet for exercise M. After the airship got up some speed, it would be easier to carry a few scout aircraft dynamically. With no electric power available, the Sparrowhawk's inertial starter was hand-cranked to get the nine-cylinder right 975 cubic inch engine going. Its 438 horses shook the tiny airframe, but soon the little Sparrowhawks were bouncing down the scrubby field. The narrow landing gear made the F-9C easy to ground loop before it reached its 64 mile per hour flying speed. The Caribbean exercises reaffirmed the folly of using the airship itself as scout. These exercises marked the first time Commander Dressel ordered the airplanes to be directed to search areas that were defined by the airship's radio instructions. No longer would the ship itself hog the scouting task. It was finally becoming a flying carrier. Fleet umpires scored Macon shot down during exercise M when she blundered out of the clouds in front of the Gray fleet. On the 6th of May, Macon's scouts successfully shadowed the Gray carrier Lexington and their information allowed the Blue Force to successfully attack the flat top. Macon's crew gained experience with every flight. Riggers on keel watch reported to the bridge via the ship's direct dial telephone system. An extensive voice tube network worked as a combat backup. Macon returned to Sunnyvale on the 18th of May after an uneventful crossing. Workers began the tail reinforcement. Herbert Doc Wiley, past captain of the Los Angeles and second command of the Akron, took charge of Macon on the 11th of July, 1934. The airplane pilots suspected an old gas bag man would ignore the ship's plane. They were surprised to see Wiley continue the Macon's development into an airborne aircraft carrier. The spy basket had been tested back at Akron's Guggenheim Airship Institute. The harness turned out to be the major aerodynamic flaw. The harness was modified and the car's tail was extended. Installed on Macon, the Angel basket was now quite stable. Officers and men took turns for the somewhat eerie, noiseless flight adventure. If the cable winch parted, a parachute would have been of questionable value. Winched down below the clouds, the telephone-equipped occupant could scout while the ship itself was out of sight. There was discussion of using the basket as a bombardier's perch in case the ship had to drop aerial bombs. Airshipmen learned tricks that allowed increasingly heavy launch loads. Fuel was substituted for some ballast water, extending the airship's range even further. Wiley challenged the F-9C pilots with ever-increasing distances from the mothership. 
Launching Macon first to get a 50-mile head start allowed her to work off a mysterious initial heaviness before taking on her planes. Commander Wiley knew the Macon was capable of open ocean search problems in the manner no other aircraft of the day, and longed for the opportunity to give a definitive demonstration. Wiley made such an opportunity out of President Roosevelt's vacationing on the cruiser USS Houston. Launching on the 18th of July, Macon soon took on her plane. Once secured aboard the airship, Aviation Chief William Cody's mechanics removed the Sparrowhawks landing gear and attached 30-gallon fuel tanks. Without the weight and drag of the wheels and struts, which were useless over water anyway, the F-9C could perform better than newer airplanes that had retractable landing gear. The modification extended aircraft range some 80 miles and increased their speed from 176 to 200 miles per hour. After two days of poor weather dead reckoning toward the expected location of the Houston, Macon launched her planes and located the President's cruiser. Pilots Cavett and Miller dropped packages that included letters whose stamps had been canceled on the airship, hoping to endear the stamp-collecting President. Congratulations relayed from the President proved to be short-lived as Macon returned to Sunnyvale on the 21st. Senior officers did not like the secret mission and failed to appreciate Macon's dramatic demonstration. About this time, the airship's communications officer, Lieutenant Howard Coulter, worked with Dr. Gerhard Fischer to install new radio direction finding gear. The antenna was hidden inside the airship's bumper bag. Senior aviator Lieutenant Harold Miller helped develop homing gear for the Sparrowhawks. Using a wire loop antenna wrapped around the wings, the indicator would continuously point to the airship's location. Growing more bold in their search patterns, the gutsy little planes eventually flew 180 miles from the mothership. Skipper Wiley drilled ship and planes throughout the summer, developing new techniques that allowed two scouts to be on station continuously. Tactical officer Lieutenant Don Mackey helped perfect a precise navigation technique called the 6060 system that ensured the trapeze would be at the appointed place before the little scout's fuel ran out. One pair could take the scouting position while the other planes returned to be refueled. A partner could save fuel by waiting his turn on frame 102's perch. Refreshed and rearmed, two F-9Cs could be launched simultaneously to continue search over an enormous expanse of ocean. During Fleet Exercise Z in October, the new techniques allowed Macon to locate the enemy fleet while flying boats were fog-bound in San Diego. When enemy carrier Saratoga launched a flight of dive bombers against the airship, Skipper Wiley applied hard right rudder and the bombers were suddenly exposed to the airship's defensive machine guns. Before the bombers could regroup, Macon's own planes had returned and were upon them. The carrier was kept under surveillance for the duration of the exercise. Attacking planes might have gotten past the Sparrowhawks. Macon's gun crews practiced warding off enemy fighters with cameras in place of machine guns. Enemy bullets could strike crewmen inside. Battle drills practiced patching wounds in the makeshift sick bay. Stabilized patients, even on stretchers, could be loaded in the Waco air taxi and rushed to shipboard or shore hospital facility. If an F-9C fell to enemy fire, the pilot could activate flotation bags in each wing and await the rescuing airship. Once hovering overhead, Macon could let down her new pilot rescue device. Equipped with two aviation safety belts, the pilot would slip in and be hauled aboard the mothership. Commander Garland Fulton came on board for the testing of a new seawater ballast recovery device. Commander Rosendahl visited from Lakehurst and was impressed with the progress Wiley had made with Macon. The Army had already adopted advanced monoplanes and there was discussion of building a modern fighter plane for the airship's defense. An old Martin torpedo bomber was dusted off and a study made of it becoming a fueling tanker plane. Ground handling, benefiting from the lessons of Lakers, never once damaged the airship during launching or recovery. The tail reinforcements were almost complete with the upper fins scheduled for the next overhaul. Macon's officers studied the planned deployment to Hawaii where she would use the EVA mast shortened from the Shenandoah days. As 1935 began, exercises found Macon's planes returning to the ship after dark and launching again before dawn. With the fleet moving up the coast during February, Macon was assigned routine practice locating and shadowing the ships. On the afternoon of February 12, 1935, Macon had recovered her planes and was heading home.
two men in the Point Sur lighthouse were watching her when Macon's upper fin suddenly disintegrated. The broken girders ripped the aft gas cell. In the airship's upper keel, escaping helium forced crewmen to evacuate. Ballast was dropped, but the stern continued to fall. Conflicting commands and the need to relay communications found crewmen cutting heavy items loose and tossing them overboard. Some engines were running full while others idled. As the stern fell, all available hands were ordered to the bow. Aviation machinist mate McArdle collected a chicken from the galley on his way forward. Losing weight rapidly, Macon rose beyond pressure height and lost a fatal amount of helium through the overpressure valves. A gallant attempt to unbolt the hangar door and jettison the planes ran out of time. Macon settled into the water tail first. Chief Radioman Ernest Daly had lost his glasses and he was killed when he jumped ship from too great a height. Some men abandoned ship from prof shafts while others sat upon the floating bow awaiting rescue. Mess attendant Florentino was terrified of the water and was seen climbing when flares caught the outer covering on fire. Chief Shaky Davis returned to the burning ship to collect more survivors. Scrambling to hold on to life rafts, 81 men were rescued by the cruisers Richmond, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and Concord. Two more Moffett Field streets would be named like the Akron's crew namesake avenue. The Navy quietly held a board of inquiry. Admiral King ordered that all officers with rigid experience collaborate to compose a document recalling those lessons learned and to make recommendations for the next rigid airship. In the following months, Dr. William F. Durand was named chairman of a special science advisory board committee that bore his name. They were tasked by the Secretary of the Navy to study not only the Macon's loss, but airship design and construction in general, and to submit recommendations for future policy on airships. The committee concluded that the Navy didn't have enough experience in rigid airships to decide if such vehicles were worthwhile militarily or commercially. So, they suggested further experiments in the building of airships of various sizes, from blimps to ZRS size, and even a metal clad of 1.5 million cubic feet. But in 1936, rigid airships again belonged to the Germans, who were just finishing the world's largest airship, the LZ-129. The government refused to buy American helium, so new gas cells were designed around the actual portal. The airship featured many innovations, from his new diesel engines to landing wheels. The new giant, finally named Hindenburg, would be a luxury hotel in the sky. By agreement with the United States, the new ship would use the facilities at Lakehurst as his North American terminus. The Hindenburg established a new speed record on his first crossing of the North Atlantic. The crew did not allow the stern beam to be used when pushing or pulling the airship but the heavy locomotive pulled the beam against the wind to line up with the hangar. Hindenburg was docked twice, and although she had been trimmed to fit hangar one, the Germans preferred not to use the hangar. Navy airshipmen were happy to keep up with the proficiency in rigid airship handling, since it seemed only a matter of time before another Navy rigid would be built. But Moffett Field had been turned over to the Army. The second Hindenburg arrival was greeted with high winds, but passengers were held off to make their connections with the American Airlines DC-3 service that flew to major cities. Station commanding officer Charles Rosendahl, George Watson, Tex Settle, and several other rigid qualified men took turns as the Navy liaison officer on the flight. Keeping up an ambitious schedule, the Hindenburg also made seven round trips to South America during 1936. U.S. Navy liaison officers went along on some of those trips as well. Not having to stop to refuel like the Graf, he made the trip from Frankfurt in as little as four days. He used the new hangar built at Santa Cruz, Brazil. Hindenburg's arrival and departure from Lakehurst became routine. Newsreel cameras were usually on hand to interview the rich and famous commuters. Local laborers were employed to help haul the ship to mooring. If the weather was bad at Lakehurst, arrangements had been made to use the Navy's mooring circle base at Paris Island, South Carolina but conditions at Lakehurst were adequate during the 1936 season. Back in Germany during the off-season, more cabins were added to B-deck, assuring the airship would return enough fares to pay for operations. Hook-on experiments were performed to allow a customs official to come aboard before the ship landed. The Navy considered reactivating one of the WACOs for the American end, with Lieutenant Min Miller as pilot. Hindenburg completed the first 1937 season trip to South America. On his first Lakehurst landing that season, Captain Proust accepted the American suggestion of a high landing as an electrical storm was clearing Lakehurst. In the twilight, witnesses noticed a blue glow that slowly turned into flames after the rudder, 
The fire spread rapidly around the stern. Suddenly the aft cells ruptured, jolting the ship and jarring the two wastewater tanks loose. The stern fell. Cameraman managed to get cranking during the last part of the fire. Within 40 seconds, the entire outer cover had burned away. The hydrogen had escaped and the structure collapsed. The horrific images forever tarnished the rigid airship. 13 passengers became the service's only fair-paying fatalities. Hydrogen gas was blamed for the accident, but within a few months, Germans' electrical experts explained to Dr. Eckner that static electricity had actually set the outer covering afire. While publicly lobbying to purchase American helium for the next ship, the LZ-130, the Germans were changing the outer covering to make it less flammable and impossible for static electricity to set a fire. A reluctant Congress agreed to sell helium to Germany, and the first shipment reached the port of Galveston. Then, Hitler marched into Austria. Department of Interior Secretary Harold Ickes stopped the non-flammable gas from becoming part of Hitler's war machine. With no chance to carry passengers, the world's most advanced airship was inflated with hydrogen and began its training flights. Just weeks before Hitler invaded Poland, the Graf Zeppelin performed one last military service. A spy basket was borrowed from a World War I museum collection and employed to obtain clear sampling of British radar transmission. The liner was harassed away from Scottish territory by British warplanes. Air Minister Goring ordered the graphs cut up for scrap, saving nothing, even for museums. On the third anniversary of the Hindenburg fire, Goring ordered the new hangars blown up as if to erase the embarrassing episode of the rigid airship forever. The Navy's general board, using the Duran Committee report, suggested building a 9.5 million cubic foot rigid designated ZRCV. It would be capable of carrying nine dive bombers. However, a more modest 3 million cubic foot rigid was to be built first in order to train crews. But President Roosevelt gave instructions that this ship could be no more than 325 feet long. Perhaps he favored the metal clad design. Ironically, tests showed that the metal clad ZMC-2 could even have been hydrogen filled and not caught fire under conditions identical to those that destroyed the Hindenburg. But the Navy held out for a classic Zeppelin design. The old tin blimp which had even been flying on her 10th anniversary, was cut up for scrap in August of 1941. The mooring mast at Iwa, Hawaii, was still waiting for her scouting rigid airship when bombs fell around it on December 7, 1941. Goodyear Aircraft updated its flying carrier design several times during the war, but funding did not come. After the war, the Goodyear Aircraft Company continued to suggest building a passenger Zeppelin, but with the advent of the ocean-crossing airliner, the idea no longer made economic sense. In 1947, Henry Ford witnessed his airship mooring mast being torn down. It was truly the end of an era. Younger generations could only marvel at the giant hangars remaining, the only visible proof of a marvelous technology long forgotten. The location of Macon's final resting place remained a mystery for more than 55 years. When a fisherman snagged on an aluminum girder, it set in motion a chain of events that resulted in the Navy sub sea cliff being directed to the Macon's resting place in the summer of 1990. The slow corrosion of 1,500 feet of water treated the delicate airship kindly during her five and a half decades in Davy Jones' locker. Out the sub's porthole, one of the drivetrains, its prop and control shaft still parallel, jut out from the bottom. Later, the Monterey Bay Aquarium and Research Institute's Christopher Greck operated a remote-controlled submersible to explore the Macon's remains. A mighty Maybach engine rests in the mud, its rocker arms awaiting oiling from the vigilant engineman. A heavy steel propeller rests near the detached gearhead. A few of more than 100 fuel tanks lie jumbled, their anti-sloshing baffles made visible by implosion. Busy Bay 7 reveals the remains of the galley as the robot's arm exhumes a soup bowl, its logo Beetleware still readable. The remains of the bow cabins lie jumbled, their chairs still usable. The most powerful radio transmitter of the day retains its Bakelite knobs, its tubes never to glow again. A pencil awaits a code copying radioman who was lost with his ship. A detached airplane wheel and tires become a home to tiny marine organisms. 
a sparrow hawk rests with the remains of the trapeze fallen on top, silent testimonial to the frenzied effort to shed weight in the final seconds of the Navy's last rigid airship. The other three F-9C2s are all here, their brightly colored wing fabric fallen away. Revealed is their innovative airship metal wing structure, evidence of a pioneering craft untarnished by five decades deep below sea level. Instruments can still be read on the panel, its leather padding grown over, its gun sight never aimed in anger. Only rock cod pilots await command to launch. The remains of the bow, the reinforcing pipe beam and frame 210 are in place to support the mooring spindle. The heavy plumb bob remains ready to anchor its airship in a solid mooring cup. With the new generation rediscovering the efficiency of buoyant flight, the future will see even better airships. Remotely piloted vehicles could operate from an airborne base. The flying aircraft carrier may once again scout for the fleet.